Martinus and Alex, how's everything going, guys? Great, great to see you, Jimmy. Um, yeah, it was fantastic meeting you in Cape Town recently. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Alex, how's everything over where you are? I, I'm not even sure where you are, actually. Uh, I'm in Indiana, uh -huh. Carmel, Indiana, outside of Indianapolis. But, uh -huh. but things are going uh, going very well. Very nice meeting you. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, I, I brought you two on the show because you guys are part of an organization um, doing stuff called Free City. So, uh, so before we kind of get started on this topic, can you uh, both give a, uh, a brief overview of who you guys are uh, to my audience? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we're Arthurus and Alex. We both work with uh, Tiplet as well as the Free City Foundation. Uh, the Free City Foundation is working to develop what we call free cities, which are small jurisdictions or territories that are uh, making innovative uh, efforts in government to promote human prosperity and community. And then Tiplis is a for-profit company uh, that's actually trying to build these new cities. Yes, yeah, and I'm um, Martinus Grobler. I live in Stellenbosch, a little um, country in the wine, or town in the Winelands, just um, outside of Cape Town. I'm an architect by trade, and also joined Tipolis sort of from the start. Um, yes, under the the founder um, Titus Gebel, that sort of uh, thought thought out this this model. Okay, well, so let's talk about the model a little bit because uh, you got you guys are pretty deep into it. But for a lot of my audience, like they they haven't heard of what a free city is, um, and maybe they've heard of like Bitcoin Citadel, something like that. But really, they they don't they don't really have any any idea. So what what is a free city, and what what's the main driver behind it, and what's what's sort of like uh, the goal that you guys have? Yeah, we think that uh, free cities are the ultimate. Bitcoin said it mm -hmm. the, the term free cities is a little bit broader, uh, and it's a recently adopted term that we have to categorize all cities that are trying to develop uh, something new and innovative that promotes human prosperity. But mm -hmm. this comes from the model called the free private city, which is explicitly developed by Team Snow, our founder. Uh, and the reason for the free private city is because he looked around the world as an entrepreneur that was active uh, in Australia, Europe, U.S., and all of these jurisdictions were plagued by the exact same challenges. It was the local politics, no matter where you were, that always created uncertainty uh, in the change of the rule of over time that made long-term investments uh, in that low time reference uh, focus much more difficult really to implement in the real world. And so Titus, which he's in his own way, uh, as well as with legal background, developed a framework for how we might have cities operate uh, that are not uh, democratic, actually by for-profit companies that have a legal framework between the operator and the resident of any given city. And this has a few advantages that I'm sure we'll talk about throughout this conversation. But in particular, what it does is keeps your relationship to the governing provider uh, very stable and explicitly outlined in that contract, which cannot be changed unilaterally by either party. So that's what I'm going to do with the basics. Maybe this has something to yeah, yeah, I think the important thing there is um, that the, the basis is that it's a voluntary contract. So that is um, mm -hmm. that is really important. And I think if you um, um, just just the concept of of voluntary commitments is very powerful. I mean, we all there's, there's this notion of that if you give people individual freedom, you end up with this individualism, which is um, completely wrong. The first thing people would do if individual freedom is to to see that, um, wait a minute, they can get a lot more if they ally themselves to other groups um, and and they'll do that. And also through the the model, you would be 
you can then be held alive, um, accountable for your for your voluntary commitments through uh, private or, um, dispute resolution that can be you know way more superior. And then you get these strong, very strong and resilient super organism of tennis club and church and school and family and and everything. Um, it, it doesn't mean everything in the in the in the free private city needs to be f uh, a fully libertarian setup. I mean, you can have mm -hmm. um, maybe a good an analogy would be nature. If you look at nature, nature is non hierarchical, but it has a lot of structure. But there might be islands of very strong hierarchy, like maybe in a tribe of baboons or in um, you know some some species. Um, the same within a within a city where you can have. Um, a, I'm a dictator to myself <laughs> and I'm in the city and you can have another bubbles of companies or family businesses or families that is as various degrees. But I think these are um, little bubbles and as they, how they interact with each other is on voluntary terms. And then you get these larger super organisms that um, that's really society is made out of, um, you know, on, on, on that level, which is, which is great. So it's, it's a, the classic bottom up approach. The idea is to have a sound process and then, you know, to trust the process for, for the outcome. Yeah. So uh, if I understand correctly, um, basically what you're advocating for is instead of this sort of like, um, you know, citizen government model, like the, these very large uh, institutions, you, you have something much more local and, uh, you know, where, where you have instead of a government per se, where you're, you almost have no choice, you're basically born into wherever you're born into. Th this one is a voluntary contract uh, where you, you, ha you get both sides kind of choose each other. And it's, uh, you know, it, uh, there uh, are obviously like no one is being held against their will or anything like that. And, uh, you know, you can come and go as you please, but it, it's, it's sort of like a practical implementation of anarcho-capitalism, if, uh, if I'm reading correctly. Yeah, certainly, I think that that's true. There's nothing inherent in the model inconsistent with anarcho-capitalism. It is a destructive human force that you think, uh, you know, certain people would hop into, and it's therefore a good entrepreneurial opportunity. So, in general, is to take as to mention this relationship from being, you know, top down, I rule you, uh, you know, I am the government and you must bow down to me, dear citizen. It's mm -hmm. taking it to a more service provider and service receiver kind of relationship like any other service on the market. You sign mm -hmm. a contract, I will pay you X and you guarantee me Y. If the terms are breached by either one of us, then we can have it resolved in an independent dispute resolution that neither one of us controls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that that's kind of pretty attractive, obviously, for uh, numerous reasons. And, you know, if if you have sort of like selection mechanisms on both sides where, you know, uh, the, the people that like seek out these things um, tend to will tend to, you know, demand certain things. And then the people on the other side that are governing, they're not going to just accept anybody. Um, and that 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 should, at least in theory, bring a lot of people together. Um, what what I found interesting in your book, uh, by the way, the the book. Uh, why, why don't you introduce the book real quick? The the one that gave me the free cities and Bitcoin one. Um, yeah, uh, what that's about. Absolutely. Yeah. So that uh, that's my book called uh, Strategies for Liberty, mm -hmm. Cities and Bitcoin. And the book is really supposed to give a very basic background on both this model of Free private cities, as well as Bitcoin, and how these two things are actually not just the best strategies to liberty for human kind, but they're actually very really collaborative. Bitcoiners should support free private cities, free private cities should support use Bitcoin uh, in their cities and promote their cities. Mm. And uh, it, go it goes through a lot of, uh, at least, uh, you know, part one does, uh, goes through a lot of like th how things would work and, and, and so on. Uh, but what I found interesting was that, um, you know, the, the argument basically that there, there have been a lot of uh, different jurisdictions that are kind of like free cities or are a step towards free cities. Um, you, you give examples like Hong Kong, Singapore, Monaco. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about like how those places work and what sort of, uh, you know, processes and, uh, you know, 
ways of working that you would take from those and you know like what what have we learned from those examples and what what are some things that um that you're looking to make with these uh free private cities that you guys are working on yeah absolutely. there's a fair amount to learn from both those existing mm-hmm. uh, case studies that you mentioned as well as mm-hmm. the, uh, historic case studies as well it's not that there's ever been a perfect implementation of the free private city, but there are analogous cases that there's at least you know some basis on which to learn about how and why these jurisdictions are successful and, and how we can apply that to our case. So I would say Monaco is really a, a sort of interesting one in the sense that it's a it's a monarchy. Uh, and it has really devoted itself to being attractive for uh, experts and super wealthy individuals. And the way they've done this is really through having that long term monarchical focus that is catering and effectively treating all residents of Monaco uh, as service recipients. Uh, you have a similar story in Liechtenstein, where actually uh, Prince Hans and Prince III. Uh, wrote uh, the book of the, uh, uh, the State and the New Millennium. And he advocated a lot of things. It's not exactly the free public city, but nonetheless, to, to boil the book down to a short sentence, the point is that states need to adapt and start treating their citizens as uh, customers in the future. That will be the way the nation state must evolve. Uh, and so we think there's something to learn from that as well. You know, Singapore and Hong Kong are similar in the sense that Singapore is a sovereign country. Uh, nonetheless, it is able to provide for its own defense. It is uh, very entrepreneurial focused. It is a world class banking sector. Uh, it's done a lot of great policies to encourage entrepreneurship, innovation, and property rights. And then Hong Kong, of course, is an interesting one in the sense that it is. So completely. Um, it has its own autonomies and has its own story of relationship with China these days. Uh, but nonetheless, it shows how Hong Kong, even with other China, by separating the legal system, by implementing the uh, British common law legal system, uh, you can see why the success of Hong Kong is so much higher than that of China. Mostly. And Tim, you probably have mm-hmm. a amount of um, no, no, I think you, you, I think you covered the the best ones. If you go back into history, there's also um, obviously a lot of things. I think one one thing that's worth mentioning is the just the scale of things. The whole idea of the nation state is a relatively new experiment and a complete failure, and that obviously um, accelerated with the sort of unholy alliance between banks and states. Um, that. Um, um, yeah, that culminated in a lot of trouble. Also, um, that very contributed to the like the Hanseatic League's end, you know, which was a great model. Mm-hmm. Which is um, so there's something to say that it's it's a de- decentralized model. So you'll have um, well, a lot of different things. Describe the Hanseatic League because I, I don't know if uh, my audience necessarily knows that much about it. Okay, so that is a um, that that was sort of a, a league that started. Um, I think from the 1300s um, as a, um, it, it was a very pragmatic thing and they um, threw throughout Europe. So that time in Europe, um, Europe was broken up in a lot of sort of little authoritarian um, pieces, or, although decentralized. So, but eventually they, it was sort of a black market that eventually through trade became formalized. They, um, and eventually they had a lot of um, clout and they could go, they were able to um, raise their own armies, build their own cities and marketplaces and et cetera. But, but it started, I think, more with, um, and you can correct me, Alex, but I think it started more with sort of shipping law and the trades um, and, you know, what's, because you have to cross country, get into contracts. So to create sort of a law system that was adapted um, and, they they were far reaching, so they they had this um, way of, some of, of trusting members. each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From I think so from Port- Portugal to to Russia almost, but mostly concentrated in the north of um, of Germany 
and yeah, from mm. the north of Europe, yes. So, city member, uh, Russia, uh, even London at certain times, it's really those northern German cities created the Hansi League. And it goes, it's important to remember that at the time this, this is the time of the Holy Empire, and these cities are able to basically say, sure, we will be part of the Holy Roman Empire, but we will negotiate, we want to have some ability to have autonomy of our own. And in particular, they wanted that autonomy so that they could trade and be entrepreneurs, and they knew that, that was what brought wealth uh, to their city. So they then formed the network of all of these cities where there was some uniform way of having contracts promoted, even common currency, uh, you know, certain cities became known as the place where dispute resolution would, would go to because they were known to have fair and just arbitration. Uh, and so it really is a dynamic example of how order would emerge in the market even amongst competing entities uh, there was a reason to work together and create this network of, of trade as it leads to yeah, and this is an important point because I, th I think for a lot of people, they think the nation state is sort of like the default way of doing things. And, uh, and one of the things I appreciated about reading about the Hanseatic League and really a, a lot of history is like that, where you had a lot of smaller you know, states that sort of allied with each other. Um, and you, you bring up a really good example of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the joke is that it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. But it, it, it was a whole bunch of little little sort of city-states within northern Germany, or what we now call Germany, really what that yeah. the entire country didn't exist. Uh, similar with Italy, right? Like it was a bunch mm -hmm. of city-states, and you can go even further back to you know ancient Greece and stuff like that. Those were all little city-states. So this model of uh, free cities of smaller jurisdictions is actually like way more normal historically than we're led to believe. We're, we're, we're led to believe like it's all giant, you know, empires or something like that. Uh, when, when in fact, uh, this is much more uh, the, the normal way that people related and uh, to their government with uh, smaller states and, you know, uh, local mm -hmm. rulers and things like that. Um, and that, that seems to be what you guys are uh, aiming to do here. I think that's exactly right. And interestingly, a new uh, study on my end is really the, the rise of the downfall of city states. And it's maybe a little bit too reductionist, but nonetheless, it's a good first approximation to say that many city states that once existed in the world are no longer in existence and therefore no longer possible because they can become empires. They grew so big. They become more aggressive, more defensive. Um, they they force printed money, or uh, you know their version of counterfeit currency. Uh, so uh, those really are the downfalls to the city state. And it's interesting, actually, in some to do this geographical expansion uh, when it's actually not necessarily for prosperity. So. There's a scale and certain services need to be provided, maybe like dispute resolution and security. We mm -hmm. think as sort of the city level. But these other uh, services, defense um, and, and trade, really actually don't require nations to trade at all. The smaller the jurisdiction, the more it's going to be to trade because they can't uh, develop like, everything really in trade. And trade, of course, there's sorry, yeah, defense to be through you know, different nations. Not that I advocate for it, but NATO right now is, is just exactly that. It's a bunch of nation states going together to supposedly provide defense. So uh, that's really our goal. What we have for us at a certain scale, it's the city scale, for certain elements, but there's no reason to need it to be a nation state and have massive territory resources for any reason. Hmm. Well, so let, let's talk about sort of like um, modern uh, sort of experiments on this. And uh, one, one of the things I found very interesting was the proliferation of special economic zones, which you, you talked about in the book. And that uh, and, you know, as you argue in the book, the first ones were really popular. 
but now just about everyone has them. There, there's almost like too many. The market is kind of glutted with them. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of special economic zones and you know why they were popular at the beginning and how they've sort of like fizzled out almost uh, as you know they proliferated and just about mm. everyone has them now. I think one of the yeah. one of the first ones was that um, one in Ireland, right, where they. Mm -hmm. Where back in the day they flew from um, London over the Atlantic, and but they couldn't make it there to top up for fuel in Ireland, and I forgot the name of the little town. And after they could um, fly further, then that wasn't needed anymore, and they decided, okay, let's we have all of this little town and people's livelihoods, so let's do the ex experiment of an economic zone, and that actually worked quite well. And then you know the model sort of. Um, um, copied from there, but I'm sure in principle it might have been even in antiquity. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure, but that's sort of a modern example, one of the first ones I would say. Yeah, well, you think it existed certainly yeah, and, uh, throughout history in some way, shape, or form. But really, the book and for the modern version, uh, I would argue these sorts of did in China in Xinjiang in uh, the 1980 or so. And this really started uh, with Deng Xiaoping realized that people didn't invest in a communist China they didn't want to invest in it because they felt like their investments would be appropriated. And so let's a different legal framework, uh, have some local authority to make them more innovative and adaptive. Uh, and it was a wild success. Now, there are a lot of studies on this and a lot of reasons for this success. And all of the social economic things are always successful and Shenzhen's location relative to Hong Kong is so important. But nonetheless, Shenzhen stands out as an example of how wildly successful these can be. As you mentioned, other countries saw the success with these models. They tried to import them into their own country. And what we see now is that about 150 countries around the globe have special economic zones. There's about 6,000 Special economic zones, of course, some defunct and smaller, and it's really quite large and operational. But 6,000 is quite a lot. 150 countries is just about every country that's not the United States or Western Europe. And it's that's why they're trying to attract investment into their countries, and that's the best way to do it. The challenge really is it is difficult to move global supply chains around. On a whim, and we've learned that the whole COVID experience. Uh, that at the margin, if you are, say, uh, you know, El Salvador, and you create a central economic system that is on par with Honduras, business already in Honduras aren't going to go to El Salvador because you have given them a similar. Thing. Their logistics already in place it would have a lot. There's a lot of fixed costs that would have to be eaten out to move mm -hmm. every of that supply chain and the new manufacturing plant or whatever. And so these special economic zones are no longer, you know, 6,001 is not going to change the dynamics of the market. <laughs> so what we are is that it is standard special economic zones won't do this, but you take it to the next level, you give them more options. You give them uh, the ability to be run by a private partner, including on the regulatory environment. Uh, that those would be innovative enough and long term oriented enough to set up policies and procedures to attract these companies over the long term uh, and, and make the investment worthwhile. So that's a story that we probably think mm -hmm. is true uh, that there's a trend towards more autonomy in these yeah. economic zones. But that but that they weren't necessarily, you know, some of them were born in, you know, out of sin in any way um, as further interventions. So um, by sometimes a, a country would build or states would build a harbor because they think politically it can give them votes in that region and they do it with other people's money. And then they realize, OK, it's a white elephant. It doesn't it can't make it turn any profit because, of course, it wouldn't if it otherwise the, if the market would have um you know, um, seen to that, that um, it would have been supported. Then for further intervention is needed, and then they create these zones around it, trying to attract people with all kinds of, um, um, you know, tax reductions, etc. So um, it's, yeah, but it's a, it's a, 
it's almost an admission from their side as well that you can't do business in the normal environment. You need these special zones to um, to operate. So, which is quite quite funny. Yeah, uh, but what what you said was really important because you can have like similar things, but there are enough switching costs that you need to give them a better deal for a lot of a lot of these uh, companies to move over. And it, you know, it, at, at this point, pretty much everybody, like you said, has some sort of special economic zone. So what what is the next level? And I, I think you mentioned one in Honduras. I think it's like called the ZED. I, I don't know what that stands for. But what's the difference between that and a special economic zone? And, you know, what, um, you know how has that uh, sort of played in the market so far? Yeah, that's a really good question. So what exists in Honduras now are called ZEDES, Z-E-E. And this stands for Special Economic Development and Employment. What happened was that some folks in Honduras uh, realized that the country was extremely corrupt uh, and that that was inhibiting their ability to develop economically. They looked at Hong Kong, all the wild success that that city had, and they wanted to create the home of the Caribbean. But they knew that Paris was coming all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so what they needed to do was carve out some part of their territory and set it subject to different laws and regulations. In Honduras, they were actually able to change the constitutional framework largely through uh, luck and happenstance as well as a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, but nonetheless, the constitutional framework was adjusted to allow for these zones. And what these zones do is typically the first special economic zones were like, we want uh, textile manufacturing. And so we're going to create the best framework for textile manufacturing. Well, it's good to have lower taxes and, and more market regulations. I don't deny that. But that's still something else. But still, some new, uh, textile manufacturing here. Mm. And what the ZEDAs would say, well, we want to take even a bigger step back. We don't know the right uh, industry, we don't know the right companies, we don't know the right entrepreneurs. What we want to do is set a framework to have a, a sort of local company with a private operator and promoter that is taking a risk and subject to profit and loss. Uh, mechanisms in the market, and we want them to create the laws and regulations and try to attract industries that they think would be successful to be zones. And so they have there are a couple of zones that now exist, and wildly different the two that exist in this interesting in its own right. Um, Prosper is the first one in sort of known. It exists on a, a Caribbean island to the north of India, still part of and they've really focused on uh, trying to be as innovative in terms of property rights, the 3D property rights, very advanced the manufacturing technology. They have um, it's just there this weekend. They have a bunch of folks that are interested in longevity down and various gene therapies and things that would be illegal in the United States because of the FDA. Uh, they're getting done in the spring. So that's a very interesting case of the other one uh, that exists in the mainland, right outside of uh, San Pedro Sula, uh, which is the industrial capital of Honduras, it's called Ciudad Orizan. And what they've focused on is being extremely efficient with how they build uh, and provide uh, pro uh, pro profitable but cheap housing that is safe uh, from the gangs and hotels in the sort of greater region of San Pedro Sula. Uh, and, and they've done that for a while. So, you know, in fact, it's the most populated of the states currently to develop, even with challenges going on with the government of Honduras, they're developing more residential housing because demand uh, is going on. And just to put it in uh, perspective, they're able to develop these units for people to live in because they don't have you know, uh, extraneous planning and building regulations, they can profitably reinvestigate themselves for 120 dollars a month. Mm. Think about that. Uh, you know, in the US, it's a 10x for an event. 
Mm. Wow. Um, all right. So you, you you have a you have these ZAs. Um, how uh, how many uh, like the the thing for me about all of these special economic zones ZAs and stuff is is sort of like the long term credibility, right? Um, and this is where you know people would rather do business in Hong Kong or Singapore versus like say a special economic zone that Kenya just set up because you don't know if it's going to be around. And uh, th this seems to be the problem with Honduras as well. They're, I, I guess, maybe starting to take them away or there's a uh, new leadership. Um, what's generally the strategy to uh, get long-term credibility uh, on these? And I, I imagine you guys are running into this as well. It's, okay, we want to set up a free city. Yeah. Like no one's going to move there if like five years from now, like just, you know, the yeah. regime changes, they take your charter away or something. And, you know, like what what's the strategy for long term credibility, I guess? So, well, you know, then, yeah, one one thing would be um, to get people moving there. It's how do you create this living organism? It's almost how do you create mm -hmm. a rhinoceros? So you have to do a lot of sort of living transplants as well. There's. You know, if people want to move there, they want to move there with their families and there needs to be schools, etc. So mm. um, one thing in the, that also is, um, is that it is, it's not just for, for foreigners, it is mostly for locals. So, um, so local people would move only a few kilometers or miles in, you know, to there. And you can also use some of the host nations um, institutions and, um um, as, as sort of a, a soft landing at the start, but getting the first hundred people, thousand people, they might be quite, quite different, uh, quite difficult, but then you can start building out your own institutions, um, your own, own idea of school, your own idea of health and food, etc. And you can conceptually reconstruct them because now you can do it in an environment where there's, um, low time preference, there's the regulation, the regulatory environment is different. Um, it's, um, on a sound jurisdiction. And there's better price discovery because of um, just because of better free economics, etc. So, so soon these um, institutions would be superior, and that's sort of a the idea that it, it'll grow, and also that it'll be supported by locals, and that they would they would prefer it. Um, not that it's competition to the host nation in a certain sense, um, yes. But if you if you have this wealth creating node um, inside your country, it's really beneficial for everyone. So that's so that's one is one strategy, the local strategy, and also to have it um, as diverse as possible um, with um, it's not just digital nomads or not just manufacturing, etc. And then another strategy that I can think of would be um, um, the bless you, <laughs> the mm -hmm. um, the um, decentralization of it and the network of it. So maybe in a region, there might be a few ones. One might be more um, smaller and um, more concentrated on education or tertiary education or another one manufacturing, etc. And then you have this um, regional network between them and even a later a international a network of international cities. And some of this network might even extend to um organizations in other countries that um, incorporate there like maybe some exchanges need to um, incorporate there just um, in that jurisdiction and start experimenting with those jurisdictions uh, just for their own safety because um, people are after them um, everyone in the freedom movement from media um, companies etc um, you know it, it might not be a bad idea for it for them to start experimenting with these um, jurisdiction and even and even investing in them for their for their own sake um, but anyway, another thing, Alex, that you might say is um, how Prospera um, are defending them themselves. Yeah. With, um, yeah. Yes, it's, I think you on a few of the key things. So I guess I would say at the outline um, that we're living in this physical world. There is no elegant solution like Bitcoin that is anti fragile and doesn't need uh, anyone's support. You know, it will keep going. Free city, more challenging. Or in the physical world, you require entrepreneurial funding, uh, blood, tears, uh, innovative thinking. Absolutely. So you don't want to sit to the with the lawless challenges, of course. The things you can do to protect these sorts of cities would be um, 
obviously strategic perspective, having local locations. So then, of course, you've invested a bunch of capital in one location. But if you have multiple locations, that are you know, a dictator comes in and wants to explore their land, you immediately call residents and future capital expenditures to the uh, different city, which, which at least is a distance. Um, you, of course, want to give locals a lot of jobs so that they support uh, what you're doing. This actually happened in the previous 40 years ago with the original Six Lake Mountains. The next government was elected and wanted to get rid of them, but it turns out that those had companies that employed something like 30 or 40,000 Hondurans, which is a big problem that no longer could a politician think about getting rid of them, but they were really something that you can help. Um, you want to have people's living rooms, and then there's the line for slow and the So those are positive ways in which you might align this. There's also uh, this sort of negative side that you have all in the sense that the in one of these three cities are made from a company that is in a different host nation. And that host nation has multi level investor protection treaties with the host nation. So, or an made under this bilateral or multilateral treaty, the seat of the station is not in the host nation where the free city lives. And this is what's in the prosperous. They were quickly as prosperous Inc. in the United States. All since made under the prosperous Inc. to prosperous the city are still through the Castle Dominican Republic so Central American Free Trade and Medicare Republic Agreement. This agreement is extremely robust. There's been billions and billions of dollars on investments that have been made under the um, And the dispute, the seat of dispute resolution is in Washington, D.C. Um, so it's not like you're going to go to a banana public and uh, go to a court where uh, you're going to fight against it. It's going to be resolved in the United States. Now, this is a 100% problem because a court outside of the U.S. could decide that Honduras is guilty and award uh, the winning to Honduras Master Inc. But how do you collect it? And this is another thing. Potentially, there's a Bitcoin in this as we move into the future. But right now, for instance, get assets outside of Honduras are seized, sold, uh, ultimately, the numbers over long term. So it's perfect uh, solution. It's an ugly solution. It's uh, in relation with Honduras. Difficult at the moment, uh, but it's ultimately that form of protection that is required to make billions and billions of dollars of investment. Uh, it needs to be protected, uh, you know, subject to these sorts of stupid and, and it seems to be holding for what it's worth in Honduras right now. It's been a few years. Of a post president being elected. Uh, she ran on the campaign of getting rid of these headaches, and she has not been able to, and doesn't even appear to be trying explicitly. She's putting pressure on them, uh, making the banks a little nervous and working with them, these sorts of things, but has done absolutely nothing in terms of expropriating the property, invading, anything like this. It doesn't seem likely that it will. It seems like in a few years. So like we'll sort of butter along and then we'll see what happens in the next slide. So it seems to be holding more mm -hmm. Well, so uh we we we've been talking about all of these different zones and so on. Where where are you guys on the project? And uh, you know, what what candidates do you have for free cities for, from a very practical perspective for a lot of people listening to this show, you know, the uh, you know what what possibilities are there for this sort of thing? Because, you know, they might be thinking, oh, you know, this sounds kind of good. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if I like the jurisdiction I'm in. I, I'd like to have more freedom, maybe more like-minded people, better governance system or privacy, stuff like that. Um, like what, what, what are you guys working on and what are some, you know, 
uh, jurisdictions that you're looking into and how far along are you? Sure. Yeah. So obviously Honduras is the furthest along. It's really the sort of OG project in the space. Uh, our founder, T.J. Steele, was the chief legal officer of Promise Pro when it started. Um, he stepped away from Promise Pro because he wanted to create Epilus and he wanted to do this in as many new jurisdictions. As possible. He saw the need to these working together to support each other. And so that's what we what's been doing. I um, can tell you um, the discussions we're having with governments are increasingly interesting. Governments are increasingly willing to autonomy, kind of perversely, uh, COVID to have made hosting a very receptive to our proposals to our dire financial situations. So we are having questions. Now what this yet, but I can tell you sort of broadly, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa are very, very you know, I would say maybe even the majority of these places are open to these discussions. Doesn't mean we're involved in uh, but we're certainly working with groups in all of those regions uh, and finding increased resources. Yeah. Other regions are on the outskirts of Europe, even in the US, getting very um, tricky with our journey in the US. Uh, and then even over in Indiana, there are a few that all the movements. Tini, any, anything? No, not really at the risk of <laughs> saying too much, <laughs> but, but there has been um, some MOU signed with um, a, a few, right? And, and hopefully soon yeah. with a handful. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, so let, let's the nature talk of these is that uh, they're very confidential out here negotiating with a government. And once you can go live, you do want to do publicity as possible, but it's not a state. They're so easy to attack politically that if we have this guy, and we don't like to have this guy leading up to elections, but if it leaks out to the public, it's very quickly something that the position can latch on to. And it, it's just... let, me, let me ask it this way then, uh, instead of like what you're working on, what, what, what's sort of like the ideal that you guys hope to achieve? And then you know, what, what would that look like? How, how would, um, you know, Bitcoiners like establish themselves in one of these places? Uh, would it, would it be like a Citadel? Like, is that, is that like a close approximation? What, 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 what's the ideal there or what, what are you guys trying to achieve? And yeah. Um, instead of telling me about the actual processes, <laughs> which seem to be fairly confidential, tell me yeah. more about like where your vision is. Yeah. So I would say by 2035, so in a mm -hmm. or so years, we would like to have three to five of these cities set up and growing with actual people living in them uh, and working together as a form of network, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so each one would have different population metrics, and some of them would be a bit more exclusive, from, you know, islands. In smaller places, the space attracts a certain clientele. Uh, but then, otherwise, it can be like most countries, they have only in the states. Uh, and so, those cities can go as deep as you want, the manufacturing and industrial capacity that you have. So, I think in 2030, you know, we'd like to have you know, three or 400,000 residents, seven to five cities, um, with, with businesses every single sector uh, and we'd like to have a very strong bitcoin focus uh in particular i think it would be fun to think about uh, one of the models that we look at is the dubai international financial center uh it's been wild success but it's very traditional field money i'd like something similar with bitcoiners make us sort of the coin uh, financial center of the world um even things about like a new form of corporation, like Bitcoin. Uh, you know, 
PD on the details, but I think that those are the sort of things that we're trying to uh, focus on. And Bitcoiners are obviously a top marketing. For, for me, I would um, say that the we we're living like fish out of water, um, even more more and more so these days. I mean, um, if you look at kids can't walk to school, there is. If you look at our food, our health, our education, everything is um, sort of debased, as you would <laughs> say in your book. And there is even one of your nice lines in your book is, what do you say? Your dreams have been this debased, um, yeah. which is so, you know, it's, um, and it's so true. So it's for me, um, you know, one one approach would be, so we fish out of water. So now let's just strap a um, uh virtual reality thing on this fish and he'll be fine and grow him some legs and put him in a little car. But what, I would like to build, you know, build a little lake for him to to go back into. Not saying that we should go back like Luddites or, or whatever, but I think our whole our whole human nature and psyche sort of co-developed with the idea of living in smaller tribes in, you know, much more um, human interaction, etc. And in a sense, those those villages were the true smart cities. Just because of the flow of information, you immediately you just walked two <laughs> two steps across the street, and there was a lot of um, little diverse shops. There was a lot of division of labor, closely connected to each other, and you know obviously that can be put on steroids and taken to the next level with um, Bitcoin and true price discovery. If you really put it on a on a um, on sound money as well, um, so then to create these um, yeah these these real smart cities like like they were in in villages in the old days and who knows what um together with new technology i mean that can really be a nice multiplier and these things are really multipliers if you take you know just virgin land and some extra jurisdiction and bitcoin and price discovery and the ideal way of how a new school can look and education can look etc um you end up with a, a massive um, potential well so um Great vision. Obviously, I think a lot of Bitcoiners are interested. How how much, uh, how much uh, interest? I guess have have you had? How many people have like put money towards this? Like what what sort of like the, I I guess like not just talk, but like actual, you know, money put put towards this or Bitcoin put towards this because it, it sounds interesting and it's a great vision and um, I think a lot of people are would love to have a community where you know mm -hmm. you're not getting the base food and you have like community and it's uh you know it's closer to you know like getting out of like uh the fiat world i think like very physically speaking would be very attractive like how how much interest have you had so far and uh not not just like people signing up for an email but like actual like money put towards it yeah uh not enough but growing, I uh, well, would say, first of all, we are in a sort of emerging market where there are not new companies trying to do something like that. There are, believe it or not, competitors of ours, and mm. on a handful. Each one, I mean, this is a really broad, you know, call it two to 50 million. Uh, yeah. With cross a little bit because they do have the physical land, they do have the operation up and running already. I think they've raised uh, maybe up to 150 million or something like that for Um uh, So that's what we're talking in terms of invest now. Um, we, are, I guess, Bitcoiners are um, segment of our investors. Mm. Uh, it is hard to get Bitcoiners to part with their Bitcoin, especially <laughs> as it's growing up, especially if we have a, I, you know, it's, uh, I get all of it, and, and it's unreal to promise a return above what Bitcoin is or whatever, four year run things or something like that. So it takes a little bit of ideological support uh, and investing to see the world, see returns. So we are getting amount to, uh, and we're finding a lot of support. Same with real estate. Uh, that industry is also relatively receptive to what we're trying to do. Um, so I think there is now we're talking tens of millions 
but when Tipolis has a project in the morning, I think there's reason to believe that you know, hundreds of millions, even up to the billions, could be on the table at the right time. It doesn't mean it's easy. doesn't mean that it's super valley accessible or anything like that, but that there is enough in these ideas that if you can find the right partnership, you find the right people, there's enough trust, uh, there's enough support amongst the, the Bitcoin and real estate. And to some degree, old problems as well uh, for, for investing in things like this. Mm. All right. Well, th that that's uh, encouraging, uh, and certainly, I think uh, as um, you know, governments get more authoritarian, uh, we'll, we'll see a lot more of this stuff. Uh, and you know, it, I, I'm glad you guys are doing it. Um, the book is "Strategies for Liberty: uh, Free Cities and Bitcoin." Uh, good read, um, and you know, it, it gives you sort of like the practical uh, aspects of what a Bitcoin Citadel might look like. And I, I, I think it's, uh, it's definitely worth, uh, worth reading. Uh, where can people find you guys? Where, where can they um, contact you and find out more about these things and keep up with the progress uh, with all of these uh, um, you know, memorandums of understandings and things like that that you're, you're getting? And yeah, where, where, where can people follow all of that? Excellent. So. You can get the book on Amazon for more about free city, for some of the movement and the philosophy. Uh, you can go to free cities.org uh, and then to keep up with Tipolis and our dealings in the real world. Go to tipolis.com, T I P L I dot com. See any, any other links? Tell us your like Twitter handles and stuff, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, um... sure. Twitter at ed lost twelve. I am there mostly just tweeting, which but you can find it. I have a Twitter handle, but I for the life of me can't remember what it was. I'm very inactive on it. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Martinez Grobler, um, M A R T H I N U S G R O B L E R. And also, yeah, so uh, you can reach out to me there if you have any questions. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm super excited about the project. And I think as we go more away from a fiat standard and more towards a Bitcoin standard, um, you know, projects like yours will, uh, will become very important because we're really like kind of looking for uh, different models of governance that, uh, that work for us. And the, the, it, it's funny because... Uh, I just remember that the uh, the thing that you guys are talking about, where jurisdictions are competing for citizens, is something that I talked about in uh, in one of the books I wrote a while ago, uh, the Little Bitcoin book. It's and you know it's 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 cool to see it coming to reality as Bitcoin takes more of a center stage. Anyway, thank you guys. Uh, it was great. Um, yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Jimmy. All right. Uh Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or a Bitcoin-native financial services partner, learn more at unchained.com.